I am Sarah McAuliffe. I'm one of the registered dietitians and certified diabetes educators at Ascension. I have been a dietitian for about 20 years. So I absolutely love what I do. I get to see people making lasting changes that really have a big influence on their lives day in and day out. But the thing that I always hear people say, and I'm curious if this resonates with any of you, is I know what I should do. I just don't do it. Any, anybody feel like that phrase might be a little bit familiar for them? So because I hear that phrase and those comments so often, I thought when I was asked to come and do a talk that that's a really good topic to try to broach with people. Try to figure out why is it that you might want to think about making changes with your routine. So that's where all of this came from. I hope that you're able to glean a little bit of information and insight into yourself as we're talking today. So the objectives of this talk today are to help you identify your why of healthy eating. Why do you want to do this? What motivates you? I also want to present you with five simple changes that can help to improve the quality of your nutrition. And then lastly, we'll create an action plan before you leave today that's one actionable step, one something that you can do a little bit differently to help have a good healthful impact on your overall nutrition. So we all need motivators, right? And I found in my career with working with people over the last 20 years, what motivates me may or may not motivate you. So we all need to find the things that help us to stay motivated. And I'm a big person on quotes, so I'm just going to share, you, share with you these two quotes. The first one, one day or day one, you decide. We can start something now, or we can always put it off. Well, one day, I'll do that, right? Or we can decide today's the day. I also like this one. I've never met a strong person with an easy past. I bet that resonates with some of you too. We all go through challenges. We all have some hardships and things. And not allowing that to be a barrier for us in terms of making nutritional changes is something to think about too. Instead of having that mindset of what can I do because of what's going on in my life, really thinking about, well, what can I do? Even if it's just 1% different than what I did yesterday is that idea we want to try to move forward with. So before we get started with anything, you should have picked up a handout at the door. If you didn't, there is the first couple of questions right here on the screen for you. I want you to think about how healthy, how healthy would you rate your current eating pattern? So on a scale of 0 to 10, this is on your sheet if you haven't filled it out yet. 10 is super healthy, couldn't do anything to be healthier, and 0 is... I have a lot of room for improvement. So go ahead and just kind of give yourself a rating of where you're at now. I see you're looking at your sheets. Once you've had an opportunity to do that, think about what is your top healthy eating goal. All of you may not want to eat healthier for the same reason. So I've listed on this sheet some of the things I hear from people. Sure, um, I can get you one too. So look at those categories and see what resonates most with you. Does everybody else have a handout? I do. Yes, you're welcome. OK. So some of you might say I want to be healthier overall. Some might say I want to maintain my weight. I want to gain weight. I want to lose weight. I want to just have better energy. I want to have better strength. You want to reduce your stress. You want to demonstrate for your family what healthy eating might look like. So really think about what's your top priority when you think about eating healthier. We certainly can't pick like three. <laughs> you can pick three, but I, would, I wouldn't label them number one, number two, and number three, sure. And then lastly, before we move on to the rest of the questions later in the presentation, think about how important is it to you to make a change with your health, or how important is your health to you? And again, it's that same number scale. So one, it's not very important at all. Or 10, my health, my nutrition are extremely important to me. 
So we're starting to think about our own motivators, our intrinsic motivators, right? All right. So now that you're starting to think about what motivates you, we know through research that food has a profound impact on our health. Every you know, five or so years, the um, dietary guidelines are updated to reflect current research. So know that some of what we're talking about comes from the dietary guidelines, some comes from other research, and some might be just my influence of working with people and seeing what kinds of simple habits seem to make a big difference on their day to day. So why do we come up with the dietary guidelines is really to kind of give people a fair chance at good health through nutrition and help them understand how the science influences their day to day choices. So we know that food impacts our weight, right? That's often when we talk about food and health, everybody goes, oh yeah, it's weight related, right? Yeah. But we also know that food impacts cardiovascular disease risk. So what do we mean when we say cardiovascular disease? We're thinking heart attack, stroke, blood pressure, coronary artery disease, and actually coronary artery disease um, is the number one leading cause of death and it's very closely associated with what we put into our body through food. We also know that our food choices have a direct impact on the development and the management of diabetes. So 10% of Americans have diabetes, but look at this number, 35% have something called prediabetes. And prediabetes means that your blood sugars are elevated, so they're not in that normal range yet. They're elevated, but they're not quite elevated enough to be called diabetes. And we know 35% of adult Americans have prediabetes, and 48% of those over the age of 65 have prediabetes. So what does that mean? That means they're much more likely to develop diabetes in the next five years if you're diagnosed with prediabetes. And it tends to be a really good opportunity for people to make lifestyle changes that can reverse some of those numbers. So super, super important um, when we're talking about nutrition that we're thinking about blood sugar management or diabetes or prediabetes. We also see correlation with food choices and cancer risk, particularly breast cancer, colorectal cancers, and bone health. So some of you may be familiar with osteoporosis or osteopenia, um, and obviously the food choices that we make impact our risk factors for those as well. So again, the current dietary guidelines that we use for Americans were released in 2020. They'll go through 2025, and then we'll get some updates. What does the science say that we're learning? But I wanted to show you this, because I think that this is pretty interesting. So what this little graph is that we're looking at is adherence to the dietary guidelines. And this is on a scale of 0 to 100. So 100 would mean just about everybody in the population is adhering to the dietary guidelines. <laughs> what you see here is 56 to 59 is the score, right? And this is looking at 2005 through 2016. So what that tells me is we're not getting better at adhering to what the science says about how nutrition impacts our health, right? If you're like me, I look at 59 and I say, well, if it were a 59% in school, I wouldn't be passing, <laughs> that wouldn't be good. Um, so what we're trying to do is get out there and educate and kind of learn how we can make some of these practical changes meaningful to people in their day-to-day -day lives. So simple step number one, and again, you're not gonna make all five of these simple steps, or most of you probably won't make all five of these simple steps. But what I want you to ask yourself as we're, we're going through this talk is, could I make maybe one of these changes? And would I be willing to kind of look and evaluate if it makes an improvement for me? So simple step number one, add protein to breakfast. And why do we say this? Most traditional American breakfasts don't contain any protein, right? So think about what I think about when I think about a traditional American breakfast would be cold cereal, right? I would think about waffles, I would think about pancakes, mm -hmm. and none of which have any protein. Those are just grain-based breakfasts. And what we see happen is when we add protein to breakfast, it helps us to regulate our appetite better. So you've probably had the experience, if you just eat maybe cold cereal and there's not much fiber in it, you eat that cold cereal and then an hour or two later you're hungry. 
and you're going, well, now what can I eat? Or people often tell me, I skip breakfast because when I eat it, I'm feeling hungrier throughout the day. But when we really dig into it, they've had a breakfast that doesn't have any good source of protein. And I'll give you some examples of what some protein-containing breakfast might look like in just a minute. The other thing that we see, and these two things are, are related, not only does protein in the morning help to regulate your appetite, but it also helps the body better regulate blood sugars. So when we ingest some protein in the morning, that can help with our insulin production, which can help with blood sugar um, later throughout the day as well. So what are protein sources? Uh, you know, traditional breakfasts, people tell me, they always think about eggs, right? But I don't like eggs, and I'm not gonna eat eggs in the morning, they tell me. I said, well, that's okay. There's plenty of other protein sources that we can do first thing in the day. So it could be eggs or egg whites, it could be cheese, it could be non-traditional breakfasts, right? Like chicken or fish or smoked salmon. Um, it could be things like nuts or nut butters. It could be low-fat or fat-free cottage cheese. It could be lentils or dry beans. I've seen people have good success with even taking egg whites and adding some lentils or something like that, or black beans and salsa and kind of making it kind of have a little more flavor there. Flavor there. So again, when we look at the science, when we look at what the dietary guidelines tell us, and they review all the current literature and then give us some guidelines, the science tells us that most people get enough protein and in my practice, I see that all the time. People tend to eat enough protein, but what we don't do well is split it up throughout the day, right? Most people eat little to no protein at breakfast, a little bit at lunch, and then they do a big wallop of protein at dinner. And what we're learning is for some of these benefits for blood sugar regulation, to feel more satisfied throughout the day, including protein in the morning may be helpful. So if you're someone that's looking to lose weight or maintain your weight, you might just kind of do a little swap, maybe take a little protein from dinner and put that in at breakfast. So there's different ways to do this. What is the serving of protein? I've got some examples for you here. It could be an ounce of cheese, which is like a traditional slice would be about an ounce, a quarter cup of nuts. It could be a half a cup of legumes. If you think about animal-based proteins, so turkey or chicken or fish, a deck of cards is about three ounces. And most people need somewhere in the neighborhood of two to four ounces at each meal. So if you're not a big breakfast protein person, you might aim for just a couple ounces at breakfast and maybe four ounces at dinner if that works well for you. All right, so what are some examples of some things besides eggs that you could do at breakfast? Uh, Oatmeal, so oatmeal would be your grain. Maybe you add a quarter cup of nuts or nut butter to that oatmeal to add some protein. Or one of my favorite tricks is when you cook that oatmeal, you can add some, bless you, um, some egg whites to that oatmeal. It actually will cook up and kind of become a part of that same oatmeal-y texture. I see a lot of faces going, huh, that sounds weird. Um, but you tend to not notice it in there. Low-fat cottage cheese on whole grain toast. It could be a whole grain or a sprouted grain English muffin. A lot of people like smoked salmon and tomato on there. That smoked salmon would be your protein. It could be something simple like sliced apples with peanut butter or sunflower nut butter if you have allergies and some cinnamon. Greek yogurt is rich in protein. And instead of putting granola on it, which adds more carb, doing some sliced almonds or walnuts can be a good alternative to increase that protein a little bit more. All right, so we said simple step number one was add protein to breakfast. Simple step number two, swap out your grains. So when we look at the science from the, the guidelines, we see that most, most Americans eat way too many grains, right? A lot of us think about grains as carbs. They're kind of catchy right now. Everybody's talking about carbs, right? Um, so too, we tend to eat too many grains. But look at this, 98% of the population is not getting enough whole grains. And I'm gonna take the next couple of slides and explain to you why that's so important. So this isn't new information, but as we looked at the trends over time, we're not improving with adherence to the guidelines. So let's figure out why, right? Do we need more information to figure out why? Um, whole grains are incredibly important because they give us a really good source of fiber 
They give us better nutrients. They're gonna help with bowel regularity. So if you're somebody that struggles with constipation, getting more fiber in those whole grains can really be helpful. We know that there's some linkage between the prevention of cancer and increasing your fiber intake, particularly soluble fiber seems to be helpful. Fiber from whole grains increases your fullness or your satiety when you eat. And those whole grains give us things like B vitamins and iron that we don't get naturally when they refine that grain. So again, what are some of the servings? You can read them here. A slice of bread is one serving. The guidelines say most people should get about six servings a day. So if you've had a sandwich, you're already at two of those six servings throughout your whole day, right? Um, if you've had a cup of pasta, a third cup is a serving. So you're already at three servings of those six servings of grains per day. So you can see here, it's not that these grains are bad necessarily. We just have a tendency to overeat some of these things. They tend to be our favorite kinds of foods, right? All right, so let's talk about why whole is so important. So when we're talking about whole grains, there's a picture here I've put on the screen for you. That's what the whole grain would look like if it's unadulterated, right? If it's just the way it is from, from life. So you can see the outside part of that grain is the bran. That's where we get a lot of fiber from when it comes to our whole grains. The middle part, kind of that beige colored, is the endosperm. That's usually where all the carbohydrate is. That tends to be the part that they save when they take a whole grain and turn it into a refined white grain. And then that last section is the germ. And the germ is where we get a lot of nutritional value, the B vitamins there, some good protein, some healthy fats. Um, so really, we want to eat all of these kinds of of things when we're eating. Anybody know why refined grains became so popular? You may have a guess. The shelf life rich people used to eat. Ah, okay, different ideas here. So maybe people that were more affluent, people who had more money ate them. White bread and things, okay. And I heard another shelf response. Life. Shelf life. So that was really where all these refined grains came from, largely. There's other factors. But they found when they pulled off the bran and got rid of it, and when they got rid of the germ and kind of set that aside and just kept the endosperm, that those grains would stay on the shelf a lot longer before they started to deteriorate or have other issues. So largely, that's why. And as a consequence, people started buying those things more. They enjoyed them more, right? Ooh, this melts in my mouth, it's so tasty. But there's some real health consequences with choosing all of these refined grains. So this chart, you don't have to study it for any length of time, but what you're seeing in the green shows you the nutrition. So you see on the side, it's vitamins and iron and protein that we would get from whole wheat. So you can see when we look at something like whole wheat, we're getting 100% of the nutrients of each of those vitamins and things. What you're seeing in red is refined, so processed grains, right? So again, they strip out that bran, they strip out the germ, and you're left with that endosperm or that refined grain. So when you look at this chart, you can tell without studying any of the details there that we lose a lot of the nutrition, right? We went from that green line that represented whole grain and gave us all of our nutritional value of all of these vitamins and minerals. And then when we refined it, we lost a lot of it. That's what you're seeing in red. So we lost a lot of that good nutrition. So what's the yellow? So the yellow is enriched, right? So the enrichment process usually means they take that whole grain, they strip the good stuff off so it lasts long in the shelf. And then when they enrich it, they take a kind of a chemical spray and add some of these nutrients back in so that people don't get deficient in these nutrients as a general population. So they've taken something that had it all, we've processed it to remove the good stuff, and now we're gonna spray something back on to give us the stuff that we know is important for people to eat. That's a lot of work, a lot of steps that don't make a whole lot of sense, right? Um, so this is, I like this graph because I think it really does a good job of helping you to understand why whole grains are much more nutritionally dense. They give us better nutrition than the refined stuff. And in that refinement process, I don't know how well you can see it at the back of the room, but like fiber, for example, when they're enriching something, you don't get any of that fiber back. You're getting vitamins, but you're not getting that fiber back. So that's something that's lost forever when we go to some of those white refined grains. Um, we don't get things like potassium back or even protein back when we do some of that refinement and then enrichment process. 
So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So when we're talking about whole grains, how do you know what you're eating has whole grains? We look at the nutrition facts, or we look at the labels, right? So when you're looking at grain-based products, or my favorite tip for people is, if it's something that's grown out of the ground, there should be at least three grams of fiber per serving. If it didn't grow out of the ground, we're not gonna find any fiber there. Fiber's a plant-based substance. So one of the ways you can determine this is first look at the ingredient label. The word whole is super important. So in this example, it says 100% whole grain wheat flour. It has the word whole, it says 100%. It's that first ingredient on this ingredient label. If it just said uh, enriched wheat flour, we're all savvy now. We know enriched just means they've sprayed some vitamins back on it, but they've taken out all the good fiber, the good protein, and some of the other healthy fats that we want to get from that grain. So the ingredient label is important to look at. Um, and then this is a nutrition facts label. By show of hands, how many of you generally look at this at least sometimes? Okay, most people are looking at these. What kinds of things on the label do you look at? Sugars, calories, carbohydrates, sodium, serving size, okay, proteins. So we're looking at all kinds of stuff on this label. So let's get a little more specific and keep in context, when I'm talking about this nutrition facts label, I'm still thinking about whole grains and how do you know if these grains that you're putting into your body are the healthier, more nutrient dense kind of grains. So generally speaking, when you look at a label, we always wanna start with number one, which is that serving size. So in this example, it says two thirds cup is the serving size. So everything else on that label just comes back to if you eat two thirds cup of it. Um, serving per container is number two. Um, that's just like a speed bump if you ask me. So if I pick up a package and I'm thinking, oh, this is gonna be a tasty snack, and then I see eight servings per container and I was planning to eat that whole container, aha, I probably shouldn't bring this home because I'm probably gonna get into trouble with that servings per container, right? So keep in mind, what you think you might actually eat. Um, if it's not reasonable, if that serving size seems too tiny, it might not be your best choice to bring it into your house, right, depending what it is. Um, so one thing, you know, particularly for people, if you have prediabetes or diabetes and you're working to manage blood sugars, looking at those total carbohydrates, number three here is important. Most people have in the neighborhood of 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate to spend at each meal. So when we look at this nutrition facts label, serving size says two thirds of a cup. So if I eat two thirds of a cup of this stuff, it's going to provide me with 37 grams of total carbohydrate. So if I've got that range, 30 to 60 is what I'm looking to spend, 37 could fit as long as I just eat that two thirds of a cup. Now here we go with the fiber again, right? This crazy dietitian's all about the fiber. So when we look at total carb, you see 37 grams there. The information below that, that total carbohydrate, the dietary fiber, the total sugars, the added sugars, are already in that total carbohydrate. So for people looking to manage blood sugars, again, total carbohydrate is really a good place to start. As a savvy consumer who wants to eat more whole grains, you don't wanna be that 98% of the population who's not eating enough whole grains. You wanna do more whole grains. Looking for at least three grams of fiber per serving is a good indicator for anything that should have grown from the ground if it's whole grain or not. So when we're looking at this example, it says dietary fiber is four. So that would pass the fiber test, right? It had at least three grams of fiber. And chances are if you're seeing that fiber, usually it's a whole grain. So you could look at the ingredients and look for that word whole as the first ingredient, or you could look at the fiber content and see at least three grams per serving or more as a good indicator of a good fiber source. Questions? Sure. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to stay gluten free, mm -hmm. how can you get enough grains with the stuff that you can eat? Sure. So keep in mind for most, most Americans, the goal is going to be like 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day, right? Fresh fruits and vegetables are gluten free. And the question here was if you're gluten free, how do you get enough fiber? So know that fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, even frozen, are still gonna give you a rich source of fiber. 
Other things to look for, again, you'd still use this same rule of thumb of at least three grams of fiber if you're buying gluten-free packaged um, tortillas or wraps or breads and things like that. So things like legumes or lentils are naturally gluten-free, tend to have a lot of fiber. Oats are gluten-free, those tend to have a lot of fiber. And some of the less common grains, things like buckwheat, amaranth, have a lot of fiber too. They're just less commonly used. Um, but sure, in a lot of gluten-free products, they're using things like rice and corn that have very little fiber to them. So just being, being choosy with what products you're bringing into your house too and how much fiber they have. All right. All right, so here are some additional examples here. So if we're trying to maybe make one of our small, simple swaps, eating more whole grains, a lot of people, if you grew up having white bread, you'll have a hard time switching over to whole wheat bread. I hear it all the time. But I find for some of those people that switching to like a higher fiber tortilla or wrap um, or like a flatbread or something like that is an easier change for them. So you might ask yourself, okay, if I can't do bread, can I switch my pasta or my wrap or my crackers to include more fiber? So what can I do instead of, well, I can't do this and I'm not gonna, right? What options do I have? So some examples here, like we were talking about that include whole grains would be things like oats, brown rice versus white rice, barley, bulgur wheat, quinoa, millet, buckwheat. Those are all examples of whole grains. Less common for some of us, but a lot of people like quinoa instead of rice because quinoa has a lot, of, lot more fiber and protein than something like white rice would. Sure. Uh, earlier you mentioned like 100% whole grain. Is that the same as just saying whole grain? Is it automatically 100%? Really good question. No. So on the, the front of the package, they like to say whole grains, right? Yeah. Includes whole grains. But it doesn't mean it's 100% whole grains. So again, when we looked at that ingredient label, ingredients are listed in order by weight. So the first ingredient you see has the most weight kind of making up that item. So they could call something whole grain, but put the whole grain at the very end, and they could still say whole grain. So that's where I really like to see, if you're going to call it a whole grain, look for it in the first couple of ingredients, or the fiber will be a giveaway again. If you look and you see at least three grams of fiber per serving, usually it's going to be a higher whole grain content. All right. Um, and again, a lot of complaints that I hear from people, why they don't want to switch to whole grains, they don't want to spend their life in the grocery store. I don't think anybody does, so that's fair. Um, so maybe you start in your pantry or in your fridge and just start looking at a few of the labels. Okay, so my grain things are gonna be things like bread or tortillas or crackers. Do they have three grams of fiber or more per serving? If not, maybe the next time I go grocery shopping or I make my grocery list, I try to find a whole grain cracker to replace my non-whole grain option. And then each week you kind of start figuring out what you like instead of feeling obligated to switch everything over immediately. All right. So we said adding protein to breakfast is a simple step that makes a big difference. We talked about swapping out some of those white refined grains, low fiber grains for whole, more fibrous grains. Number three, <laughs> it seems too obvious. We all know this one, right? Eat more veggies. We've been saying this for years. Um, so it's recommended on the dietary guidelines that we get at least two and a half cups of vegetables per day. So look at your fist, right? Your fist is about a cup. So at least two and a half cups of vegetables per day. Now, to me, that's a low estimate. We see things from like the American Cancer Society that suggest seven to 12 servings of fruits and vegetables per day or way more than this. And most of those should be coming from vegetables, right? So two and a half should be kind of bottom of, of, of the barrel here, but most Americans don't get enough vegetables. Um, so again, you know a cup, if it's raw, is one serving. If it's cooked, a half a cup or about a half of a fist would count as one serving. So as you're thinking about your own choices, how are you doing on your veggies as we're talking here? Why are vegetables so important? <laughs> because everyone's always said it, no. Um, we know that vegetables are important because again, they're a rich, rich fiber source. So vegetables give us a lot of fiber, a lot of nutrients, but not a lot of calories. So when we eat half of our plate as vegetables at each meal, we're getting a lot better nutritional quality. It fills up our stomach, right? So to feel full, to feel satisfied, we need 
some volume in our stomach for most people. Vegetables are a really good way to build some of that volume. Or my husband will always say, well, you eat them first, you get them out of the way, and then you can enjoy the good stuff. <laughs> uh, I don't always love that he says it, but it's true. I mean, get them in, get them done. They're so important. Um, also, I didn't mention, but we know also dark and kind of strong colored vegetables are rich in potassium. So if you're somebody that is working to lower your blood pressure, getting more potassium from foods is often helpful. Now, if you have kidney disease, that's, that's different. You may not be able to eat foods that are rich in potassium, but if you don't and you're looking to manage your, your blood pressure, that may be a good way to do it. All right, so what are our tips here? How do we get more vegetables in? We know we should be doing it, but how do we make it happen? Um, so these are some ideas for you that just come to mind for me. Adding more vegetables to your favorite recipes, right? So especially soups and stews and things like that, I find almost all of the time, if it calls for a cup, I can add two or three cups of vegetables. It gives it better flavor, and I'm getting extra servings of those vegetables in there without even realizing it, right? So that can be a good way to do it. Um, adding vegetables to your sandwiches or wraps. Maybe you shoot to have a salad for a meal a couple of times per week where you get a large amount of different colored vegetables in there. You could also make vegetables more accessible. So a lot of times we buy veggies and we have good intentions and we smile at them and we put them in the crisper drawer and then they kind of die in the crisper drawer, right? Because they're out of sight, out of mind. So when you get them, cut them up or buy them cut up, put them in the middle of the fridge or at eye, for me, it's not the middle of the fridge, it's the low shelf because I'm short. Um, but put them at eye level for you to help encourage you to get those vegetables in, right? Make it accessible. I've seen a lot of families uh, are super successful even if they don't plan to eat the vegetables, if they buy a veggie tray or create one in the fridge and just pull it out before lunch, pull it out before dinner. And as you're making things, it's a good way to nibble and not even think about it to get some of those vegetables in too. At work, just you know, making it easy. Again, throw some veggies in a bag at the beginning of the week or on the weekend so you can grab those and go. I find people who put them on their desk, if they kind of have that environment, are more likely to eat some of those vegetables if they're in plain sight. If you don't work, then just putting them on the table. Here's my baggie, I've got to eat that before lunchtime is a good visual reminder for you too. Um, and when you're eating out, any of you try swapping a starch or a grain for an extra vegetable? So instead of that potato, maybe you do extra steamed broccoli or whatever vegetable is on the menu that day. Doing a salad first or a vegetable uh, soup first can be a good way to do it too. And lastly on this slide here, never estimate the power of a good, convenient, frozen, steamable, microwavable bag of frozen veggies, right, to add to just about anything. So maybe you eat out frequently, but you take half your meal home and it's not quite enough to fill you up for the next meal. That's a good opportunity to take those leftovers, maybe you throw a bag of steamable broccoli in the microwave and add that to those leftovers. You're getting more veggies, you're getting more bang for your buck with the leftovers, and you're more likely to be more satisfied. So make things convenient for you. Frozen are great, so don't feel like it has to be fresh veggies to get the benefit out of it too. Frozen, packed at peak ripeness, so sometimes we actually get better nutritional quality than the fresh stuff. Anybody, anything else anyone wants to add, ways they sneak in some extra veggies? Do you want to comment about or sure. canned vegetables? Sure. If, if sure, I, I tend to put the canned vegetables on the bottom, whereas if I have nothing else to eat for a vegetable, I'm going to use a canned vegetable. I'm going to rinse it, right, to help remove some of the sodium. Um, if you have canned vegetables, uh, I, if you buy them, try to look for the low sodium or no sodium options, right, um, but then definitely rinse them. But I'd rather see canned vegetables than no vegetables, but if you've got kidney issues or high blood pressure, the sodium in that would be the biggest concern. Better than nothing, absolutely. All right. All right, so now we're moving on to simple step number four. There's only five, so if you're still awake with me, we're doing good. Um, I think this is a big one, and sometimes we don't, we don't recognize how important this specific idea is. Replace a processed snack with a real food. So here I show you, you know, the ingredient labels on some of our packaged foods there's just a lot to know there. You feel like you need to be a scientist to know what you're putting into your body when you see something that has 20 to 50 ingredients in it, right? Real food sometimes can be just as satisfying 
and you don't have to worry about all the science that's gone into that, right? Like we said, fresh fruits and vegetables naturally are going to have that fiber, so you don't have to worry if they have that three grams of fiber per serving. Um, but sometimes it's finding the right substitutions that work for maybe what you're craving or what you're wanting to snack on. So some ideas, you know, real food snacks, and what I'm meaning by processed stuff tends to be things like a lot of us snack on chips and popcorn and what else, pretzels and ice cream and what else, donuts, pastries, mm -hmm. what's in your cupboards? It all sounds tasty, right? Um, so the question might be, could at least a few times a week you replace that snack with something that looks like real food, something that you can recognize as food? Um, so things here, you know, it could be nuts and fruit. I always like to pair, if I'm eating something that tends to be fruit or grain-based with some kind of protein, so that's what you're seeing here. So nuts and fruit, hummus and veggies, peanut butter with your veggies, like peanut butter and carrots or peanut butter and celery are great little combos. In the winter, I like to heat up my peanut butter so it gets melty and add a little cinnamon to it so it's kind of warm and dips those carrots right in there, it's good. Um, Edamame, if you've never tried it, is kind of a soybean, but it's rich in protein, high in fiber. You usually buy it in the frozen section, so you can let it thaw just at room temperature, or you can heat it in the microwave if you want to. That can be a nice, healthy snack. Chickpeas or chopped veggies um, with vinegar and oil. If you prep that in advance, that lasts for several days and has a lot of good flavor to it. Um, especially this time of the year where we're starting to get tomatoes and cucumbers and onions and things fresh out of the garden or from the farmer's market or grocery store. Um, throw in a can of chickpeas and it's going to be a lot more healthful in terms of satiety and fullness. Roasted veggies can be a good snack. So like if you're making dinner and you roast veggies, make double or triple the quantity so you've got some to grab as a quick snack. Most of the time we're looking for those processed snacks because they're quick and we don't have to think about it, right? That bag is so easy to open. So if you try to make some of the things um, that are real food based, quick and convenient, you can have that same convenience. Olives, I'm a big olive person too. All, the, all my friends at work tease me because every day at lunch I'm having like five to 10 green olives. Because for me, it's really satisfying. It's a real food, it's a healthy fat, but it's got a little salt there sometimes that makes it more satisfying than just a piece of celery, right? So kind of use what your body is drawn to to think about a real food replacement. All right, our last simple step or possible option. What's that? What about dried fruit? Dried fruit. Dried fruit can be a nice simple swap, but dried fruit, we lose the water, right? And so it tends to be something that's a lot easier to overeat. So something like dried fruit, I'd say just try to stick with the portion that's written on the nutrition facts label. So, sure, apricots, raisins, dates, those kinds of things have good nutritional value, but know yourself. If you're kind of prone to just handful after handful, might not be the kind of snack you want to keep lying around. But if you're good about kind of keeping your portion relatively reasonable, then sure. All right, so simple step, step number five, just trying to replace animal-based proteins for plant-based proteins. So we know red meats, and keep in mind, red meat's not just beef. Um, pork is considered red meat, lamb is considered red meat as well, and we've got quite a lot of research now that says the more of red meat we eat, the higher the risk for cancers of the digestive tract are. So there's a direct correlation. Uh, processed meats are in this category too, so think lunch meats and hot dogs and things like that. They're not exactly sure what component of the processed meat seems to increase our risk for certain types of cancers, but there is that association with both red meats and our processed meats. Um, so replacing some of those things with a plant-based protein can be a good environmental change. I think we've all heard this at this point, right? But health-wise, there can really be some strong benefits. Um, plant-based proteins also give us a lot more protein and fiber. So when we think you know, good fiber content, we think lowering heart disease risk, we think fullness, um, and also may help with weight management for some people too. So some ideas here too, if you've not tried this before, I think lunch or breakfast are often really good meals to start with a plant-based protein. A lot of us try to go too big too fast, like and do it at dinner, and then we're like, well, I don't know what to make for dinner, but sometimes it's easier at lunch, which tends to be a lighter meal for many people. So it might be a salad, and instead of putting chicken or fish on it, you put some garbanzo beans or black beans on top of that salad as your protein source. 
Uh, many people find it easy to adapt to like a bean-based chili. So maybe you leave out the beef or you leave out the ground turkey and you add more non-starchy veggies and you add onions and you add some kind of bean in there, right, as your protein source. Um, again, you're seeing lots of legumes and lentils in this category because they provide a lot of good nutrition for us. So that's intentional too and it's an easy swap for people. Um, again, replacing beef or even half of it, often I'll do ground turkey and then add some black beans into it and I'll kind of stretch it out. So we'll get more, more taco and bean mix or we'll get more soup out of that because we're stretching how much we're eating um, with those beans in there too. Or taco salad works great. Lentil soups can be an easy adjustment for some people with some veggies to pair it up with. And then a lot of people are trying spaghetti squash and that you can just make in the microwave, remove the seeds, kind of use a fork to make it into noodles, and maybe add some chickpeas and tomato sauce and a little Parmesan if you wanted to kind of replicate a spaghetti dinner. So just different ideas for you there. So again, what were the five simple steps we talked about? Again, my expectation wouldn't be you go home and do all five simple steps. If you do, you're an overachiever, good for you. Some of these you might already be doing, but then look for maybe one that you're willing to give a try to, right? So would it be trying to add protein to breakfast? Would it be paying a little more attention to some of your grains that you have at home and next time you do your grocery shopping, choosing ones that have three grams of fiber or more? Would it be really making, and this is a good time of the year to work on increasing those non-starchy veggies when they're fresh and they've got that great flavor, but at least three cups or more per day could you replace a processed afternoon snack is the one that I see a lot people or the after dinner snack with a real food um, and then trying to include more plant-based proteins. Could you substitute an animal-based protein once or twice a week with something that's plant-based? All right. So if we've got it, this is just a short video. It's a little quirky, but it's cute, and I think it gives us some good ideas. So if you all don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and play this um, to give you some other ideas of how to incorporate some of what we talked about, too. What can you make your family for dinner that's healthy and tastes good? You can follow the plate method. This healthy eating plan works for everybody, including people with diabetes. Indeed, making nutritious, healthy meals will be a snap. What's a healthy plate? It's a way to control your serving sizes where you don't have to count. Simply use a seven inch plate for children and a nine inch plate for adults. First, divide the plate in half and fill one of them with vegetables. There are two types of vegetables, starchy like potatoes, corn, peas, or plantains, and non-starchy like zucchini, jicama, cucumbers, carrots, or salad. If you have diabetes, fill half your plate with non-starchy vegetables. Then fill one quarter with whole grains or starches, like brown rice, corn, beans, or whole wheat pasta. In the other quarter, add some lean protein like tofu, grilled fish, or chicken. What about adding a side of tortilla or bread? It's hard to resist, I know! <laughs> the trick is, serve yourself a smaller portion of the other starches on your plate instead. To complete your meal, Add a drink like unsweetened coffee, tea, or a glass of milk. But remember that drinking eight ounces of milk affects your blood sugar just as it would if you ate another tortilla or a slice of bread. Or you can also choose water with a squeeze of lemon or lime. How you create your plate is up to you. You have many options, as long as you remember to follow these healthy guidelines. And ta-da, you're all set. You might be thinking, how can you use the plate method to make vegetable beef soup or other meals? Simply follow the same idea. Fill your pot with low sodium broth and lots of healthy vegetables like corn, cabbage, zucchini, carrots, and onions, and some lean beef, but not too much. 
just like you'd put on the quarter of your plate for each person you're serving. If you want, add your favorite type of bread on the side. And you've got the right amount for a healthy meal. Mmm! Mmm! Enjoy! All right, she's a perky bell pepper, isn't she? <laughs> Never met a, a perkier bell pepper. Let's go back to our worksheet in front of us and let's finish that second part of that uh, handout there. So we're now going to that question that asks, what's one thing that we talked about today that you could change or that you might be willing to change? So think about those five simple steps is there one thing we talked about today that you think you could, could do a little differently? And then go ahead and move on to the, the next question. And I really encourage you to think about spending some time thinking about this question. Remember, no response is too small or too big. What would be the benefits to making these improvements? So if you said you know, your overall goal is to increase your energy, and you thought adding protein to breakfast might help you do that, well, how is more energy going to be beneficial to you in the long run? What would you think you'd see on a day or even hourly basis that you'd be able to do if you had more energy. So spend some time really writing out possible benefits of making that change. If some of these ideas might be helpful for you to get to a healthy weight, you might think, well, what would the benefits be of getting to a healthier weight? I hear people say, I can tie my shoe easier. I can climb the stairs when I'm putting away laundry more successfully. I can you know, travel with my family. I reduce my risk for heart disease. I better control my blood sugar. So those responses are individual, but really, even after you leave our talk today, bring this paper with you, and maybe you add more benefits as you start working on this, something you didn't know you'd get out of it that you've started noticing that you are getting out of making that change more consistently. Give you just a few more seconds to finish your thoughts here. And maybe even put this paper somewhere that you could see it or that you'd be reminded of it. I've seen people hang it on a mirror, on the fridge. People have told me they've folded it in their wallet. And so every time they go to get their credit card out or cash out, it kind of pops out at them. And they, oh, yeah, I'm working on this. And this is why. Um, be helpful to yourself to remind yourself why it might be important. All right, and again, um, so my name's Sarah. I am one of the dietitians and diabetes educators for Ascension. I work at the Diabetes and Nutrition Counseling Center. So we're in Auburn Hills, kind of across from Oakland University. And primarily we work with people who have diabetes and prediabetes. So some of you may be familiar with our diabetes prevention program. There's a class that's happening at the Orion Center that started a couple of months ago. Um, that's a really good program, so you can go to our website I've listed here um, and look under Diabetes Prevention, and there's a home page that would show you um, for Ascension Michigan any diabetes prevention programs that are going to start. Some are in person, like the one here at the Orion Center. Some are considered distance delivery, so they might be done something like Google Meet or Zoom on a computer or mobile device. Um, so check that out and most people don't know that they have prediabetes so I'd like to take this as just an opportunity to make sure you're inquiring about that with your provider and there's a couple of ways they can tell if you have prediabetes through lab testing they can look at an A1C which is a two to three month average blood sugar and if your number is 5.7 to 6.4 that's considered prediabetes 
They could also look at your fasting blood sugar number. And if you see a range of 100 to 125, that's an indicator of prediabetes. Again, not that you have diabetes, but your blood sugars are elevated beyond normal and not quite diagnostic for diabetes. So Ascension offers diabetes prevention programs, but there's you know, diabetes prevention programs nationwide as well. So know that those resources are out there. For many of those programs, they'll either bill insurance or it could be a free program. The one here at the Orient Center, Ascension is offering for free. What did you say for the A1C, what was the guideline? Pre-diabetes is 5.7 to 6.4. Yep, or a fasting blood sugar would be 100 to 125, would be pre-diabetes. So under that would be normal, normal blood sugars. Um, but that's one of the things that we do. Sometimes people will come and meet with one of the dietitians one-on-one -on -one to kind of talk about what their eating looks like and some changes that we can make to help uh, better regulate blood sugars. Um, and again, our primary focus at the Diabetes Center is for people who have diabetes, type 1 or type 2. So we do a lot of individual training for people and some group classes as well. Thank you all for your time today. I hope you picked up at least one little habit that you're willing to try to do a little bit differently um, from our talk today. So thanks again for everybody's time.